dazzling new California Speedway, site of the final PPG Cup race of the season, seems an appropriate place for a review of the year just finished. Welcome to Rear View Mirror, a retrospective of the 1997 PPG Kart World Series. Hello again, everyone. I'm Bob Barsha. It seems like only yesterday our scene was the Metro Dade Motorsports Complex in Homestead, Florida, as we awaited the start of the first race of the 97 season, the Miami Grand Prix. Well, that was 17 races ago, and in those 17 races, we saw terrific competition. Some of the closest grids in history, three brand new race winners, the youngest winner in series history, and the closest finish in the history of IndyCars here in North America. In the next 60 minutes, we'll take a look at what we think were the highlights of the 1997 season and use those key moments as a jumping off point to talk with some of the personalities who made it such a great year of racing. We'll also talk about the equipment that carried us to the end of the year and back-to-back -back champions for the defending team titleists from Target Chip Ganassi Racing. It's all ahead in the next 60 minutes, and joining me is our regular ESPN commentary team. Let's hear from them now, beginning with my booth colleague, former series champion, Danny Sullivan. Well, Bob, in my segment, we're going to talk about the tire war that took place between Goodyear and Firestone, and it was a great battle all season long. Then we're going to go over and visit with Team Ray Hall. We're going to talk to uh, one of the oldest drivers in the series, Bobby Ray Hall, and his teammate Brian Herta on how they felt that their season went. And then we're going to go visit with Scott Pruitt. And remember, he was the winner down under in Australia. We're going to find out how he felt that his season ended up. Gary? Well, Danny, I'm going to be involved in a couple of roundtable segments that I think that our viewers will enjoy. The first one involving Roger Penske and his team, drivers Paul Tracy and Alan Sir Jr., reflecting on the real roller coaster ride that they've had in 1997. And then, of course, we're going to be talking with Chip Ganassi and his world championship racing team for not one but two consecutive years, Jimmy Vassar from a year ago and the now reigning new champion, Alex Zanardi. Think you'll enjoy it. Jan? Gary, the Newman Haas racing team had highs and lows for 1997. Of course, the highs were Michael Andretti winning the first race of the year. We'll talk to him about it, as well as his teammate, Christian Fittipaldi, who had that grinding crash in Australia. Now, there was a newly crowned Rookie of the Year, Patrick Carpentier. We'll talk to him as well. And don't forget, we always like to include some technical tidbits on engines and chassis. After a break, we'll recall our first memorable moment of the 97 season and speak with the year's first two winning drivers. This ESPN Speed World presentation, the 1997 Kart Rearview Mirror, is being brought to you by American Honda, maker of fine quality automobiles, motorcycles, and power equipment. The season began on the Oval at Homestead, Florida, and it began in storybook fashion for Michael Andretti and Newman Haas Racing. Andretti's come-from-behind win vindicated Carl Haas's decision to back the all-new Swift chassis and provided a proud moment for Papa Mario and the entire Newman Haas operation. Of course, all this was old hat for Michael. He did the same for the Reynard chassis in its very first race back in 1994. Here's Jan Bikas. Well, Bob, it certainly was a storybook start to the season for Newman Haas Racing. Michael Andretti joins us along with Christian Fittipaldi. And for you, Michael, that first race, I know you tested well, but did you really think you had a shot to win it? Um, yeah, I did, actually. I thought we did. The car just felt very good. Um, we, but then we did struggle for a little bit. And then uh, the morning of the race, we, we made a change in, in the morning warm-up, and the car felt very good. So from then on, I felt very confident about it. But... Uh, you know, it was just a great win for the whole team. They put such an effort in, and I, I felt happier for everybody involved there than I did myself at that point because they put in such an effort. I know you guys have put a lot of effort into testing, and Christian, uh, part of testing, unfortunately, is under all kinds of conditions. And in Australia, you had the, the worst of all conditions to test that car with a big accident. Uh, were you pleased with how the car held up? Well, <laughs> uh, in a way, yes, of course. I think if the car hadn't held up, very well like the way it did maybe i wouldn't be speaking to you guys right now and and obviously uh completely different from mike my, my season was like uh, very hard starting because in miami i lasted about 20 laps and then i went to to uh to the second race in surfers i lasted three quarters of a lap and <laughs> and then i was watching all the races back home but i think that's the way it went and and obviously i, I took it in a way that someone had to eventually teach me a lesson and I was happy to be back in the car in Portland again. 
we were very happy because you qualified third, finished fourth in Portland. How can you run so quick after being away for so long? I, uh, I think I'm going to break my leg again because uh, <laughs> when I was on crutches, we seemed to be going better than lately. <laughs> Let's talk about lately, Michael. Uh, you had a very nice string in the middle of the season, three second place finishes, but then it tapered off. But it was the same time that Firestone really became dominant. How much was tires and how much chassis? Um, I would say uh, most of it was tires. Um, the chassis, was, we were learning throughout. Uh, the chassis is not right yet on the permanent road circuits, but uh, we had improved it. But unfortunately, Firestone took a jump as well, and so it, it made it a little uh, tougher for us. So it was, uh, it was a frustrating stint there in the middle of the season, for sure. And, and there were some races we still could have won, believe it or not, but we just had bad luck in the races, you know, and Christian was in the same position. We just seemed like everything would go against us. But, um, you know, the good thing is that we were fairly competitive, even though, uh, you know, we, we didn't have the best combination. Let's talk about 1998. Uh, you expect the Swift to be much different, Michael? Um, it's not going to be a whole lot different, but it's going to definitely be improved because there are some areas that we, we figure that are weak that you really couldn't do, you couldn't fix. You had to do a total fix on it. And, and so we, we feel pretty good about uh, uh, the car next year. I think it should be pretty even more competitive. Both you guys set for 98? I'm set. Yeah, we'll be here. We'll be back. Uh, I, uh, uh, this is like home for me. I've been here so many years, and there's been Andretti, and an Andretti with this team ever since uh, it's it's been formed. So uh, I'm glad to say that I'm going to be back again. Okay, more Swiss for 1998. They're back with the team, so more to look forward to in 1998. Danny, we're standing here with Scott Pruitt, who's been with Patrick Racing now for four seasons. Going to be there for a while longer, right? Scott your win in australia tell us about that wow it was it was awesome you know one i don't know what it is about there why well, i love going down there and the people just really open their arms and accept me down there and second the fact that i was down there on my honeymoon made it all that much more enjoyable we did all these things and came through and won the race well now that was fantastic well what about your your overall 97 <laughs> season how do you feel about that well i feel that um we certainly didn't produce the results that, that we were capable of you know we had some pulls we had a win, we had some, uh, uh, started from the front row a number of times, and, and just had some bad luck, just some strange things, especially as the season was, was winding up and in Vancouver, getting together with Fernandez and, and Laguna, getting together with Ribeiro, just, you know, just some stupid things. It, it takes racing luck, and unfortunately, we didn't have quite as much as we would have liked. Well, we wish you luck for 1998, and uh, hope you have the season that you want. Thank you. As we go to break, here's a look at the final rookie standings for 1997. Despite missing several races, Patrick Carpentier is the Jim Truman Rookie of the Year. Back from the finish in Rio de Janeiro for his second in a row. He then made it three straight with a measured drive to the win at the all-new Gateway International Raceway in Illinois. Here's Gary Gerald. But with the Roger Penske racing team now, Roger, of course, the man who uh, calls the shots for the team with his drivers, Al Unser Jr. and Paul Tracy. And Paul, we've just seen the video of the three consecutive wins early in the season that really set a tone for you and brought uh, a rejuvenated team, I think, together. Uh, then, of course, you ran into some tough luck late in the season. I I'm sure you wish you could kind of balance some of that good luck that led to the three victories with the tough luck that knocked you out on the first lap of so many events late in the year. Uh, it's been a tough, it's been tough to swallow, but, uh, you know, starting the year out, the team was really uh, charged up. We had a, a pretty extensive testing uh, over the winter, so everybody was, was key to try to get, get a win uh, in the columns in, in uh, 97, and, and we were able to pull that off at Nazareth, and, and that led us on to three consecutive victories, which is what the team needed to, to get charged back up. And, and I guess maybe deal with some of this hard time right now. You know, the crew is still very up. We've got a lot of testing on the plate going into 98. So we've got a lot of changes coming and, and uh, putting us in the right direction. Did, did you ever feel, I mean, did you get discouraged? Did it kind of drag you down at any point in the season? Well, I think you, you always do at the time when it happens. But you got to look, look to the next weekend and, and look at where your mistakes were and look at where uh, things that happened during the weekend that were positives and uh, focus on positives. and and work towards the next weekend and the next race and the next year. We're, we're focusing now on next year. Al, with more than 30 wins in your career, but it's been a couple of seasons since you've been able to experience that elation, how has that been for you to deal with? Is that, has that dragged you down at any time? 
Well, it, uh, it, it has gotten frustrating, sure. I mean, I can't, uh, can't say that it hasn't, but, uh, you know, there has been uh, uh, real reasons why we, we uh, I haven't been able to go into the wing column, and, and uh, most of those reasons are out of my control. And so, um, uh, you know, it's just, that's the way racing goes, you know, Dad. Dad's always telling me when you're hot, you're hot. When you're not, you're not. And uh, last couple of years, we've been we've been struggling to get uh, the burner going. We talk about the wins that Alice had in his career. Roger Penske, you've had so many victories in your great career in this sport. Has it ever been tougher to win than it is right now in kart? I think the competition is at the highest level I've ever seen it uh, in this. To call it Indy car racing, and we've been in this sport now for almost 30 years so we've seen it when you bought a car for twelve thousand dollars and now it costs you <laughs> half a million to buy and so a lot of things have happened and the competition has certainly gone up uh, you know we have you know had three races we start out the season hot uh, but i think we got to put it into perspective you know there's pressure on al there's pressure on uh, certainly paul for us to you know be able to produce victories but with the competitive nature you know of the racing you know, we've got two tire companies, we've got uh, three or four different chassis, so there's lots of different combinations, and I can say this for both of our drivers, we haven't given them the best car we could give them in, in certainly in 96 and 97. I think our car was well suited as it was, even in 1996, you know, we had a couple of races there that right. we should have won that we didn't, but you know, everybody can say that. We didn't win them, but we did win three in 1997. Uh, and I think that uh, if you look at the, at the history right now, there hasn't been a Goodyear car win a road race, uh, and yet we were able to be very competitive on the oval. So, and that's where we've really been struggling. And I think at the end of the day, uh, we've just got to get our car better on the short tracks. Uh, uh, when I talk about short tracks, meaning the street circuits and then also the competitive circuits like Mid Ohio and Elkhart Lake. And certainly the test program that we have uh, going into next year, we're going to try to develop a car that uh, will be uh, a front runner. Now, again, there's a lot of good competition, as you said earlier. It is the toughest I've ever seen it. You look at the grids, whether it's on an oval, whether it's on a road course, uh, two or three tenths can take you from 15th and make you 6th or 7th. And track position is key. Yeah. And, I, and I think I can speak for everybody who's involved in the sport. There is no team that will work harder than the Penske team at trying to get back up to achieve the level of success that I guess all of us have become accustomed to uh, over the years. We wish you all the very best in 98. Thanks for joining us. Bobby Rahal, driver extraordinaire, and now team owner, which you've been doing for a lot. That's two very uh, tough hats to wear. Listen, you were very close in Brazil. Your thoughts on that? Uh, a heartbreaker, naturally, to uh, control a race like that, and then um, to uh, not be able to finish it off was uh, uh, very disappointing. Although I must say, uh, the disappointment was softened uh, to a large degree by the fact that we did control the race, you know, and. As you know, any race car driver, you don't get many opportunities to control a race uh, in your career, and it was just going beautifully. We knew what the situation was, and we just needed a break. We needed a yellow, and it didn't come, and, and unfortunately, we paid the price for that strategy, but uh, it was at least nice to run up front. Well, now, the one question, you're kind of the senior citizen, if you like, of, uh, of kart racing at the moment. Any plans to uh, stop, or, or uh, any plans just to keep going for X number of years? I haven't really put a time. I mean, we're definitely going to drive next year, I, but I haven't put a, a real, um, you know, I haven't really put a time limit or, uh, I mean, as you say, I'm an owner too, so there's a lot of responsibility, a lot of obligation. Also, this is going to be a younger man's sport. It's kind of fun as the old man to go out and rub, uh, rub wheels with uh, guys half your age, but uh, certainly next year we'll be there. Uh, after that, uh, I, re I really haven't given her too much thought. Well, good luck in 98, and thanks. Thanks, Danny. Bobby Rahal and his countrymen won the Nations Cup in 1997, while Brazil, Canada, and England produced first-time winners. We'll be back to meet them in a moment. In the closest three-way finish in IndyCar history. And on the streets of Vancouver, a quick pit stop allowed Mauricio Gugelman to outduel Jimmy Vassar and take his career first. Well, of course, nothing announced that a driver has arrived in the PPG Kart World Series like a victory. And I have three first-time winners this season with me. From my left, Greg Moore, Mauricio Gugelman, and his teammate, Mark Blundell. Mark, let me start with you. Your results this year were always in the 8 to 12 zone before all of a sudden at Portland, you break through for the victory and follow with another one later on at Toronto. What is it that allows or perhaps makes a driver come through to win? 
Uh, actually, Bob, I think we, we started to improve at Milwaukee. We, um, we were definitely a lot faster there and more productive throughout the whole race weekend. And Detroit, for sure, we were very quick as well. And very unfortunate as well at that point. But uh, I think that the chemistry with me and my side of the team wasn't quite together yet. Uh, we didn't carry over from last year with any chemistry. And we went into the new season. It still wasn't quite right. And we sensed it. We made some internal changes. And from those changes, we've been very, uh, very good since. But, you know, it's, it takes a long while to get that right. That first win was also the closest three-way finish in IndyCar history. What are your memories of that race? Um, I think actually probably one memory is actually just seeing Gilles start to raise his hand and not realize that it didn't really win the race. But <laughs> that was, it was a great race. I mean, fantastic one. I think really good for everybody to watch as well on TV and at the circuit, changing conditions, and to come through on the last corner of the last lap and just pinch the win was uh, very satisfying. Now, for your teammate to come through and win first among the two drivers on a team, what kind of pressure did that put on you, Mo? Of course, that puts a lot of pressure because that's your direct competition. Uh, everybody looks, well, those cars should be the same. One guy is winning, the other one is not winning. What's the problem? That's what comes to people's mind. But we've been running very well from the beginning of the year. And a lot of races, we, we've been close. As Mark said, at Detroit, we kind of handled that to to Greg, but that's one of those deals that we made a, a really a decision that was tight on Phil, and we're just waiting for that to happen. Came first to Mark, but we've been running competitive really well. I mean, both cars well through the year, and uh, that's the way it goes, you know. It took a bit longer for me, but I finally got in Vancouver. First team to come through and win with both drivers on its strength this year. The PacWest team has made enormous strides in the last year. What, what is the key element in the equation that has made PacWest so strong to allow you guys to pick up victories this year? Well, there isn't one single thing. I, I, I've been involved with PacWest a lot longer than, than Mark, and it wasn't this year. The whole planning started way before, two, three years ago, and it just takes time. In this kind of competition, you don't buy success. You have to earn it, and you put a bunch of people together, and you have to wait until that chemistry really works, and everybody starts to kind of read your mind. That's the stage you, you want to get. When everybody's reading each other's mind, that's when everything gets well and runs together, and you start to have success. And you guys are set with brand new contracts, and I assume you'll have the same lineup for 1998? Yeah, we're all ready to go. Unfortunately, Mark took all the money, so I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> I just got the scratch and Mo took it before I got there. But uh, we're looking forward for the next two years. All right, congratulations on a great season. And you, my man, now the youngest winner in series history. Did that put any pressure on you, thinking about getting that first win and beating Alan's or Junior's old record? It, it didn't. I think last year I was probably thinking about it more, but then this year, it's just I just wanted to finally get the, get the first one. I didn't care when it was. and. Uh, you know, I think the press probably made more of a big deal. Oh, and, you know, there's you know, two races to go, one more to go, and then you know, I, then I finally did it. And once I finally did it, it was a dream come true. I mean, it was uh, 12 years in the making to finally get there. And then pick up the next one right away under that curious situation with these two guys in Detroit, <laughs> first Mo and then Mark, running out of fuel with just a couple of corners to go. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, it was unbelievable, really. It, uh, we went to Detroit thinking that well, you know, if we can be in the top five, it'd be a good result for us. And, my guys gave me great pitch tops all weekend, and um, you know, we came out behind uh, between behind Mark and uh, Maurizio, and we took the white flag. And I'd resigned myself to third. I thought, wow, these guys—they did a great job conserving fuel. I didn't—we didn't think that they could make it. And um, you know, then sure enough, Mo ran out in the back straightaway, and I thought, wow, that's pretty good. And then, uh, then Mark ran out in the last corner. I, I just couldn't believe it. It was just. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where you know I had a little bit more time to savor that one because we had two weeks in between that and Portland. Great victory for you and the players' Forsyth team. Rumors that that might be a two-car team next year. What's the story? Uh, I hear rumors, and I've, I've heard yes, I've heard no. So I mean, uh, I think right now what we've got to do is just worry about, uh, you know, worry about next year. We're trying to win the championship for me, and then if I have a teammate, well, he can finish second. Well, congratulations to all of you, and many victories in the future. Bob, one of the stories early in the season was that of the Lola chassis. Many teams even jumping ship before the very first race. Others, like this team and Richie Hearn, decided to persevere to find what might be the problem with the chassis. Well, that remedy never really came for Lola. Now, for both Swift and Penske, they certainly had moments of brilliance, but the chassis to have for 1997, without any doubt, of course, is the Reynard chassis. Now, engines were much closer. Ford made huge developments over the winter, winning the first race. Mercedes won then a string of races, both on fuel economy and horsepower. So it looked like the 1996 champion Honda was falling behind. 
but before the end of the season, Honda closed that gap, and it was a great finish with a lot of parity. Here are the numbers. With nine victories from four drivers, Mercedes-Benz picked up its first open-wheel championship since the Formula One world title back in 1955. Another key element of the 97 kart season was the rise of a trio of talented rookies. From Canada, Patrick Carpentier, the 96 Toyota Atlantic champion, led strongly at Gateway for Tony Bettenhausen's team. From Scotland, Dario Franchitti parlayed his street racing experience as a member of the Mercedes-Benz touring car team into a pole on the streets of Toronto, driving for Carl Hogan. And from Brazil, Walter Salas, while driving for the modestly budgeted Davis Racing Team, still was a factor in the rookie championship right down to the final race of the year. Here's Jan. With a large emphasis always placed on the overall driver's championship, there's also a large focus on rookie of the year. And capturing the rookie of the year championship for 1997 is Patrick Carpentier. First of all, congratulations, Patrick. Uh, for you, what does this really mean now to be on the same list as other rookies of the year, Nigel Mansell, Jacques Villeneuve? I mean, that's really got to be a thrill. Yeah, it is a thrill. It means a lot to me, especially how uh, competitive the card series is. And uh, we've been, we've had good race this year, and it was good for us, so I'm really happy about it. Are you surprised how fast you came up to speed in your very first race? You qualified and finished in the top ten. I mean, that had to be a thrill as well. <laughs> yeah, that was good. We had a good season on oval circuits. It was really good. The first race was, uh, was good, and St. Louis, of course, was uh, really good, too. So I was really happy the team gave me a really good car and a car that lasts to the end of the race. So it was important for the rookie championship. Now, St. Louis. You say that was a great race, but it was also a heartbreaker. You almost won that race, had to slow down because of fuel. How tough was that thinking you had a chance to win that first race? Yeah, it was pretty tough because I argued with uh, Tony for about five laps, and uh, he kept telling me to slow down, and I didn't want to slow down because he said I was going to run out of fuel. But uh, when we finished, we actually only had one-eighth of a gallon of fuel, so we didn't even have enough to make another lap. So uh, it was good. I was happy about second. You know, a podium in the uh, card series is really precious, and uh, finished second was good, so I was still very happy. Now, you talked about learning lessons. Being a rookie is all about learning lessons. What is the biggest thing you think you've learned in 97? Uh, how competitive the card series was. It's really competitive. And uh, you got to work hard, and you got to learn a lot. I had to learn a lot this year. And uh, the difference between the last year and this year is last year in Atlantic, when the good guys are there, they leave the next season. Here, the good guys stay, and the ones that are not so good leave. So it's a really tough series, so I've learned about that. What about riding mountain bikes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've learned not to ride them, but maybe I will still in the future. <laughs> now, speaking of the future, you are billed to be a star of the future. Where do you expect CART uh, and just the overall championship and the international scope to take you in the years to come? Yeah, I hope that uh, we'll be competitive enough on the road and street circuits in the coming season to, uh, to be able to fight for the championship. And I think it should be good now that I've learned a lot more this season. I'll begin the winter testing with more knowledge. And so it may be better. So if it's good on the street circuits, it's already really good on the ovals. So we should have a good chance. All right. Well, thanks for talking with us. And, of course, keep your eye on him in 1998. Danny? We entered our second season of Goodyear versus Firestone. Now, the amazing thing is over the season, these tire manufacturers do a tremendous amount of testing with the teams. They're changing the compounds, the constructions. They go back and forth. And the incredible thing is they never really tell the teams what they're doing. They just come with all that information, put a tire together, and show up at that race. The very first race, Michael Andretti, Goodyear. They were dominant. Then Paul Tracy gets on a run where he wins three short ovals in a row. But Firestone came back. They won on the streets. They won on the road courses. They won on the ovals. And the incredible thing is they had a dominant run in the rain in Portland after they had a disastrous tire the year before. In my opinion, what really helped all season long was the consistency of the Firestone, the most poles and the most wins. And for the second year in a row, they won the tire war. And with their success has come popularity. At least two teams have announced that they'll switch from Goodyear to Firestone rubber for 1998. Nobody loves cars more than I do. 
Each one is a work of art. So when the maker of all these chose a new antifreeze, it got my attention. General Motors now uses the deck school technology of Haviland Extended Life Antifreeze in virtually all its new vehicles. The same patented formula you can use in your car for five years or 150,000 miles. So do what GM did. Switch to Haviland. I use it in my car. I only wish this were it. Good flies are... You stink! Get off the stage! Your mother's an iguana! Hey, my mother's half iguana. I'm sorry. I meant no disrespect. I never met a quarterback. Never, never, never met a quarterback I like. I want to take him out. It's sissy. They're a bunch of pretty boys. Pretty boys. No if and bless about it. A bunch of... Watch out! <laughs> Intimidate. I can taste it when I hit him hard. Easier to dominate. Just a bunch of prima donnas. Take out the prima donna. Prima donna. That's what I'm paid to do. I'm just shocked they know the word prima donna. Oh. 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 Every so often, something new comes along that makes people go back to rethink. Go back to reconsider. Go back to the drawing board. Introducing the larger, more powerful Accord. An Accord like no other. From Honda. For every lap we lead this year, we're donating $25 to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. For every pole position we win, we're donating $1,000. And 5,000 for every victory. Man, this could get expensive. The 1997 kart season produced a career-best second-place finish in the championship for Derek Walker and his team. Remarkable, considering the way the season began. In Homestead, Florida, driver Gilles DeFerrin tangled with a slower car and crashed. In race two in Australia, DeFerrin had a titanic collision with Christian Fittipaldi and was lucky to be able to re-enter the race with a backup car. DeFerrin then took pole at Long Beach but fell victim to another late race crash before they got their season turned around. Joining us now, Walker Racing team owner Derek Walker and driver Jill DeFerrin. Let me ask you both to assess your first year together. Your best performances, both for you, Jill, as a driver, and you, Derek, as a team owner. How was the year? You first. <laughs> well, you know, driver was a bit of a problem early on in the season until we got... No, it was... Uh, seriously, it was a good season. I enjoyed it a lot. We had, um, had a lot to do coming back from last year, and we didn't do that well, and had a lot of new things with Honda and Jill and the team dwelling together. So it was a good year, I thought. What did you think? Yeah, I think it was a wonderful year as well, Bob. Uh, you know, we obviously didn't score as many points as we were hoping for in early on in the season, but ever since it was uh, plain sailing, really. Uh, I think uh, Derek did a, a really good thing uh, actually last year by signing everything really early, so we had a good time to get ourselves prepared for the season. We hit the ground running in Miami, and uh, it's been good ever since. You matched Alex Zanardi top five for top five. You led more races than anyone except the champion. You'll finish as runner-up. Is there any sense of regret of what might have been after the crashes put you so far behind after the first couple of three races of the year? Well, in a way, yes. In another way, no. I mean, I'm a very pragmatic guy. So, I mean, what has happened has happened. And uh, there's uh, nothing you can do to, to, to change it. I mean, uh, little what has what happened in the beginning of the year, I felt was under my control or under the team's control for that matter. And uh, it's just, you know, the, the cards that we were dealt with and I just kept my mind on the job and um, that was that really. <laughs> From the team's perspective, Derek, when you're working on the car after every race, I guess Long Beach is the, is the, the real egregious example. Mm -hmm. Big crash with Salas in the practices, then crashing out of the race. That's a lot of work for the team. How do you keep the team on an even keel? Um, well, that's where having an experienced team pays off because when you've been in this business for a number of years, you realize there are a lot of highs and a lot of lows and you, 
you've got to be able to carry your way through the you know the lows and um, full credit goes to the team we never missed a beat and we had uh, a lot of things to to do in the early stages and the momentum was really building early on even though we had a lot of work to do and that carried out through a whole season and that's really what um what 97 for me is all about i think the team really did an outstanding job and were very consistent through the whole year and that's um, full credit to them really now let's look ahead to 1998 any changes well, we're definitely going to win some races. I think that's exactly Jill right. Say. Jill assures me, and I've assured him we will. Uh, no, more of the same. I mean, we look at it, it's a, it's a three year contract. You know, we've got a three year term here uh, with a number of the pieces that we've got in place in our program. And this is really 97 was the first year, 98 is a you know, stronger year yet. So we just want to rub on it a little bit. No, no major changes. I think it's pretty well in place. Well, congratulations on a great year to both of you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Yeah. Now let's go to Jan Bikas. Bob, after great things for Andre Ribeiro in 1996, we expected to see more in 1997, but he was somewhat crippled by the Lola chassis, even though he did finish sixth in the second round in Australia. But the big moment for you, Andre, certainly was changing to the Reynard chassis in Cleveland, because at the second race, you were already up on the podium. Yeah, this uh, brought some hope to us. Of course, we, it was a disaster in the beginning of the year with, uh, with the performance of the chassis. We had the team ready to go. We had good uh, financial support from our sponsors, from LCI. And uh, we had a fantastic technical side, very good engine. We've gone very good tires with Firestone. And uh, unfortunately, one element of this whole package put us on the back. On the middle of the season, we had this opportunity to run with the rain and, and uh, brought some hope. But of course, we lost the, the distance between, uh, from, from the others who start testing so early on the season. And uh, it was a little disappointment. Now, this guy, of course, is known for that famous pass at the end of 96. But you're with one of the best teams. Your thoughts on your 97 season? Well, you know, it's always hard to review an entire season uh, in a short period of time. You know, you got to look at all the factors. But I think, uh, in a nutshell, I feel pretty good about the year. Uh, we qualified really well at a lot of races and had a fast car. Things didn't always go our way, and we didn't finish as high up in the points, certainly, as we wanted to. Uh, so that's something we need to improve on for next year and, and try and keep the speed and the consistency and even bump that up a little bit, too. Well, Brian, you've proved you've got the speed, the talent, everything that it takes, but uh, I know how frustrating it is to get that first win. Is that is that something that's eating at you, or do you feel a tremendous amount of pressure with that? Well, yeah, only because you get asked that a lot. You know, when are you going to get that first win? And, and I think, uh, you know, when Big Mo won his this year, and, uh, you know, he said it best, uh, one of the best things I think about winning your first race is people don't have to ask you anymore when that's going to happen. And you know, there, there's pressure certainly from the outside, but from yourself too, because you know, okay, it's great to, for people to say you're fast enough to win or you've done this, you've done that. But until you actually do it, you know, it is, it's all just a lot of talk. Well, good luck to you for your uh, 1998, and uh, congratulations on a great season in '97. Thank you. Thank you. And now it's time to meet the PPG Cup champion for 1997, Alex Zanardi, with car owner Chip Ganassi and teammate Jimmy Vassar, when we return. We've been working out the bugs, <laughs> brain fest, and pulling up on our scare tactics. Now we're all ready for brain fest. At Six Flags Great America, weekends during October. A ghoulish good time for the whole family, with frightfully fun rides and shows. Plus two incredible bugs. Chilling Houses of Horror. Fright Fest. At Six Flags Great America, the most monstrous Halloween happening around. Open Friday nights, Saturdays, and Sundays through October. Also open this Monday, Columbus Day. Out here, it's not the fittest you survive. It's the most prepared. Or don't come at all. Shootouts, shutouts, and sharpshooters. The playoffs are here, and the title march is on. Conference Finals Game 1, Thursday at 8, MLS on ESPN.
Body of a pickup, soul of a race car, horsepower by the truckload. The NASCAR Craftsman Truck Series, live from Fontana, California. Saturday at 3.30 on ESPN. It would be hard to pick a key moment of the 97 season for Alex Zanardi. The 96 Rookie of the Year enraptured crowds with his signature victory donuts. He took the most pole positions, led the most laps, and won the most races, including his first on an oval at the U.S. 500. Alex Zanardi was simply the man in 1997. He's standing by with Gary Gerald, car owner Chip Ganassi, and teammate Jimmy Vassar. Bob, it's a pleasure to be able to sit here with a championship team once again, and for the second consecutive year, of course, Chip Ganassi is the man who has orchestrated a championship in such tough competition with his drivers, Jimmy Vassar, who won the title last year. Alex Zanardi, the championship is now yours. You've had an opportunity to think a little bit about what this 97 season has been like, and I'm wondering, when the season started back, what, seven months ago, on the other side of the country, here in Miami, Things didn't really go great for you in the first part of the season. Were you ever discouraged? Were you really concerned at any point? Ah, uh, no. There's no time for that. No, you you have to you have to do your best, no matter no matter what uh, what the situation is is going to be. And uh, and if you're lucky enough, there is about a million things that can go wrong <laughs> in racing, and 900,000 are controlled by luck and not by you. And uh, and uh, if you're lucky enough to, to, to don't get any of these 900 reasons or things hitting you or getting into your way and you have the talent and the skill like, uh, like everybody at the top of Chip Ganassi has, uh, then, uh, then you may win. And then if it happens again, you may win the championship. Well, certainly it began to happen at Long Beach and then about in the middle of the season, I think in particular of Cleveland. You had the incident where you went to the back of the field and then that dramatic run all the way up through in the wide open spaces of Burke Lakefront Airport. Yeah. That had to be, maybe, was that the key point of the season for you? I, it looked like, I, I don't think it changed anything because we were all pushing very hard since the beginning. Um, since then, we had things falling in places, but uh, not because we were pushing any harder. I don't know, maybe, you know, every, every day you, you accumulate experience and um, sure enough, the old team was stronger at the end of the season like I was, but everybody, every single mm -hmm. mechanic chip as well. And uh, y y y you learn and, and, and you avoid to do little mistakes that sometimes may cost you a good results, but I do believe uh, uh, simply we, we, at the beginning of the season we had some misfortune. Most of them were not due to to factor on our control was simply simply what racing. yeah simply what uh, what it makes racing interesting you know the fact that it's unpredictable and sometimes the fastest guy doesn't always win the race well with the victories then in this great mid-season surge came your signature now the donuts after the <laughs> checkered flag did that happen by accident did you have that planned how did that evolve um, well, actually, uh, that's, uh, that's something that Nigel Manso used to do, and uh, he actually used to do that every, every single test when the day was over, just to have <laughs> some fun. And, uh, and um, in Long Beach, I did it just to find a way to celebrate, and, uh, and, and then I saw the kind of uh, um, enthusiasm I, I, I start into the fans, and, and I did it again in Cleveland, and probably it was, it was very important for me that uh, the perception it came out is that I wasn't doing that just to get um, attention, just mm -hmm. to get uh, exposure. I was just doing it because I was happy. I wanted to find a way to celebrate, and, and, and I'm happy that, uh, that all the fans understood it that way, and, uh, and they start to ask me. Um, please, Alex, do it again. Please, Alex, do it again. We like to see those donuts. And then when I had the opportunity again in El Carlo Lake, I did it. Didn't want to let them down. There's a special bond, it seems to me, between our past champion, your teammate Jimmy Vassar, and yourself. Jimmy, it's unusual for teammates to like each other, but I, I definitely have gotten the feeling over the year that you guys are really good friends. Yeah, we've become, we've become good, good friends and, uh, you know, working close together uh, for two years now. I mean, it's... it's it, from, from my standpoint, it's hard not to like a guy like Alex. He's very warm, very honest, and uh, very giving. And um, you know, it's just a natural. Seems seems natural that uh, that we would be friends. And, and it's not just Alex and I. We have that kind of uh, synergy running through our whole racing team. And you know, Chip can attest to that. And 
you know, maybe that's part of the reason why we've been two-time champions. And certainly coming from your standpoint, these last few events of the season that have seen you with a resurgence, I know that's meant a lot to you because you've had more than your share of frustration over the course of this year. Yeah, you know, it, uh, a lot of ups and downs come with motor racing, and uh, uh, it's been a nice surprise to get back on track. We we buckled down and we got down in the notes and tried to find out some of the reasons why we weren't uh, we weren't having the success that Alex was having on the other side of the team and uh, we we saw a few areas that we could uh, that we could uh, try to, to make some changes and uh, fortunately uh, you know it helped out our side of the team in the last couple races and and um, you know I think with, with that momentum we can carry it on into the off-season testing and and hopefully be uh, be a you know a front runner next year and be a contender for the championship. Maybe I can get Alex to go for a best two out of three. <laughs> <laughs> a lot at stake. And I'm sure that, uh, Chip, we don't want to ignore you. Uh, you would certainly endorse that. But I, well, a thing that kind of tugs at my mind, as a former driver, you had grand days in the cockpit when you had tremendous satisfaction. How does the satisfaction now of achieving back-to-back -back championships as an owner, as an organizer, as a manager, compare with the best days you had as a driver? That's a good question, Gary, because I think... Uh I think this means much more to me because of, of, of so many people's lives we're touching now. You know, when, uh, when I was a driver, it was sort of all me, me, me. And it's, it's, it's much more satisfying now to, to, to have two great guys like I have pushing the pedals and, 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 and touching their lives, touching the lives of the people at Target, touching the lives of the people at St. Jude's mm -hmm. through that program. It, and, and so I think it's... it's uh, much more gratifying for me in this position to be able to to bring something nice to all those different groups of people is this a super team now in open wheel racing <laughs> i don't know those are those are monikers that uh fans give teams i think uh i remember a day in uh at monterey in 1996 we were a super team that day and we were a super team uh at cleveland this year i think and again in monterey this year i think that we were a super team that day and uh, you know that's for other people to say whether what what they want to call us. But uh, I, I I I sure uh, if I was giving if I was giving out names and it was solely up to me, man, that's one I'd certainly have to consider. Well, it's a pleasure for us to be able to set in in the company of champions, and we congratulate you guys on back to back tremendous seasons. And for you, Mr. Zanardi, a particular congratulations. Thank you. That moniker of champ is going <laughs> to. Wear real well, I'm sure. It's been a pleasure to talk with these guys. Bob? Here's a look at the final point standings for the 97 season for Alex Zanardi, the championship, clinched with a race to go in the 97 season. Michael Andretti began the year with a victory, finished eighth in the championship. Rookie of the year, Patrick Carpentier, finished 17th despite missing several races along the way. We'll be back to get the thoughts of our panel of experts in just a moment. race of the season is our final key moment of the 97 campaign. On Friday, Patrick Carpentier crashed, putting the rookie points leader on the sidelines for the weekend. Also involved in Carpentier's accident, newly crowned series champion Alex Zanardi, whose weekend was over as well. The race itself began with a bang at the back of Juan Fangio's Reynard Toyota. Mauricio Gujamin led away under green from the first 240 mile an hour pole in motor racing history. Turn four produced two more key accidents, Paul Tracy and then Art Meyer and Ari Leyendijk subbing for Zanardi. When Greg Moore lost an engine late in the race, Mark Blundell took advantage of the opportunity to pass Jimmy Vassar for his third victory of the year. With that, the 1997 PPG Kart World Series season came to an end here at the California Speedway. Now it's time for all of our commentators to pontificate a little bit about the season past. I'll start things off by saying... You always want to see the most deserving guy out there win the championship. And to me, that was Alex Zanardi. Despite the controversy at Vancouver, the fine and the suspension, suspended suspension, I should say, Zanardi was clearly the guy to win the championship this year. So I think the story ended the way it should. Well, he certainly brought, uh, I think, a welcome uh, breath of uh, flamboyance, a lot of charisma into this series. And I, th I think we all, frankly, really enjoyed that. And I know that... The drive that he made that, that I thought was key when he really started his surge at midseason. He got bumped to the back of the field in Cleveland, came back through there in the wide open spaces of Burke Lakefront Airport. That's going to be one of the big memories of 1997 for me personally. I just thought it was a scintillating drive.
I think also if you look at that fine and you're talking about what happened at Vancouver, Sonardi was what, doing what he did all season long. He was aggressive. He went for it. He was clearly the fastest almost every place that we went. And that's what got him to the points lead. That's what took him there. I think he shouldn't have changed. I, I don't agree with some of his passing tactics. I wouldn't have wanted to have been Brian Herta. <laughs> but he did what he had to do at a place also like Vancouver where that's about the Tough only way you can get by. Yeah. And I think technically he had the package, and at the beginning of the season we thought maybe he doesn't have the package. It looked like he might have to have a Swift, he might have to have Goodyear tires at the beginning of the season. Ford really came back strong, but it was the Honda engine, I think, that came on later in the season, and definitely Firestone, like you said earlier, Danny. I mean, Firestone could certainly be the topic, technically, of the season that made it that much easier for Zanardi. And another of the stories has to be the competitiveness all season long, the parity, to use the cliche, up and down the pit lane. We saw that virtually any driver out there could win a race on any occasion. Even a couple of rookies, Carpentier and Franchitti, led races strongly at one point. I think you go right through the field, and, and we have in this show talked with owners, with drivers, who've all said it is tougher now to win in this sport than it's ever been. And we got to see that on 17 different occasions all season long. And look at some of the breakthroughs that we had with Greg Moore and the Pac West team uh, that were winless to that point. Uh, Jerry Forsyth is an sure. owner, and those guys, they hadn't been there. And here they go, and boom, they're in the winner's column, and they did it in a very convincing fashion on more than one occasion. So, you know, you could say one time, well, he got better fuel mileage, but you couldn't say that overall because they came back and won it again in uh, strong style. Well, does that, I, I can't help but wonder, has the balance of power shifted <laughs> in this sport uh, from what we've seen in years gone by? Because it wasn't that many seasons ago. It was strictly the Penske team that dominated, flat dominated. I, Not the case now. I think what's happened is there's a lot of good people out there. And I'm not just talking about drivers. I'm talking about team managers, chief mechanics. They've gained experience at Newman Haas and Penske, which were the strong ones, Pat Patrick from years ago. And what's happened is they've all come together. There's more sponsorship than we've seen in years past. Reinhardt has a very good chassis. Lola had one before. They're going to be back. And the engine parity that was out there as well with the Honda, now with Mercedes, Ford, Toyota's coming on strong. You know, having said all of that, there's a lot to choose from, and that uh, kind of equalizes the playing mm -hmm. field. Well, now we begin the long off-season of testing. When do you suppose the 1998 scenario is going to begin to come into focus? Yeah. Well, we know it's not going to be the first race, uh, because in 1997, <laughs> we thought we had it all figured out, that it was going to be the Swift, like we said. Uh, Penske looked good, certainly on the short tracks, on smooth ovals, but it wasn't until half-season that we really saw what was going to happen, but I think what happens when you have this kind of parity that Danny was talking about, if somebody misses the mark by just a little bit, it was Lola this year, certainly it was Penske at a lot of racetracks, and certainly Toyota, um, if you're a little bit off where you need to be, I mean, you're, you're just way out to lunch. So if they're going to try and have the parity, you know, come to the level and everybody have a chance, you've just got to have it right on. And we have something that's going to be really tough next year. There's a 19 race schedule, and people are starting testing right here now, right after the race that just happened. They're, they're already testing for 1998. So you have to have a strong budget and you have to have consistency and you have to be able to maintain all the way through that period. That's going to be tough. Well, that's the story of the off season. That story is about to unfold and we'll be watching it closely. I'd like to add a personal note. This has been my first full season here on the PPG Cart World Series broadcast team and I'd like to thank all of you three guys and Jack Arood, who's not with us here this weekend, for making it a great ride for me. We'll be back in just a moment to wrap things up. From California Speedway, stay with us. The Transamerica. Coverage continues today at 5.30 on ESPN. This ESPN Speed World presentation, the 1997 Cart Rearview Mirror, has been brought to you by Goodyear, number one in tires. Here's a look at the 1998 CART schedule. 19 events at all. It all begins with testing. It's known as spring training, the first week of February on the newly reconfigured Oval at Homestead, Florida. Two new events include an Oval at Montegi, Japan in March and a street circuit in Houston, Texas in October. Who will be driving for whom in 98 remains to be seen. Announcements are expected throughout the winter. We'll leave you with a tribute to our champion, Alex Zanardi. I'm Bob Varsha. Until next year, so long, everyone.